Well, thank you, Farah, I think. Thank you. <laughs> OK, tour de force. What does that mean for us in the construction industry? Well, for me, um, it's where we have creativity, drive, ambition, and we deliver something beyond just beauty. Beauty we can be to behold, but what is an idea that goes forward? What might change the world, or by its timeliness, actually feed in to change? Sometimes it's just serendipitous. Sometimes the planets align. But sometimes it's also having ideas that develop through time. Wonderful quote by a total genius, of course, Albert Einstein. But it inspires us to think about what we do, or have a curious approach, to think differently about how we do our day-to-day -day work. But also, if we're curious in our approach, it also means that we, have a, we build up ideas that then feed into our current projects, our current ideas. And partly I want to talk about some of that, that theme of, le of learning, how we can learn through our professional lives, how we can evolve ideas and do things, maybe in a different way, feeding back from our, our memory of previous work and previous projects. So I'd like to talk about a couple of those things today. This, this project, I mean, over 15 years ago now, uh, we were asked in our associates to um, help BP um, prepare a small pavilion uh, for the G8 um, conference to be opened by, by Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, a fascinating man to meet, I can assure you. Um, but it was only eight weeks to go. Their idea was porter cabins with some PV on top. We thought, well, that's not really very good. It's not good enough, is it? Is it good enough? No. So we designed and created, built, constructed this pavilion in eight weeks um, from a standing start. And it's timber frame. It, it generates more power than it uses. And it became a centerpiece for meetings and co uh, conversations during the G8. So, so something that, that started a conversation about how to build quickly, how to build fast, and how to um, change people's minds about the art of the possible. Sometimes modesty, incremental change, is a very important part of our work. And again, adds to our general uh, thought processes, our general ideas. This project by British Land, a plantation place just north of the city, near Barbican, um, as you can see. Um, this uh, was about putting people first uh, in some of the design decisions. So creating gardens in the sky, building on previous projects and further projects of British land. When we first started doing this kind of thing, we looked down on the roof, rooftops and saw plant equipment. Now we see planting, people, activity. And Macquarie Brank, who occupied this, going up at their barbies out on the terrace, which is rather nice. We communicate with our buildings, our urban realm. People interface, interact with what we do, what we create. Sometimes it's very indirect, an experience, an emotion, um, you know, a facility, uh, sometimes very practical. But sometimes we need to be direct in our communication. Actually take the bull by the horns and say, we need to tell you about something, not be quite so subtle. This example is Vauxhall bus station. Uh, some may say unglamorous. On top of this bus station is integrated PV array. No one knew it was there. How would we communicate to people that this thing was there, doing good thing, things, saving carbon? So we actually put a display in the public realm for, for people to walk past and see, so they could identify exactly what was happening well, up, up above their heads. Maybe they stepped back and looked at it uh, in a different time, knew it was there. So we communicate with what we do. And so to our first sort of, I suppose, a, a tour de force, something that changed how people thought about uh, a building typology. Um, we all use our phones a lot these days for Instagramming, for data processing, for all sorts of things. Every time we Google, every time we search, uh, we are tapping into data, data centers, um, a, a new agglomeration of, of intensity of data processing and use. And a project that came to us in Citibank um, at the time, uh, now City, uh, and we, we discovered that every time you do a, a search, enough energy is, uh, is liberated by data centers to make a cup of tea. So every time you search, that is the energy that we're responsible for, at least in the old days. So Citigroup came to us with a project, and the project was uh, a data center, 10,000 square meters, a large one, a big one, to be in Europe. Now, they're very unglamorous buildings. This is the inside of a data center. Uh, so your Instagram is in here somewhere. It's racks on the left-hand side, cabling on the right, lots of heat, lots of energy, lots of power going into these buildings. And so they need a lot of support. So we support them with huge machines uh, like this. Now, when we were designing this building, we started designing, the amount of energy required going into a data center was one and a half times more than these things, than the data center used. So these machines are using one and a half times more than the data processing. It's called a PUE, 2.5. Um, so we thought, well, that's, that's not very good, is it? No, we must do better. But at the time, no one did green data centers. They were embarrassing. They were hidden away. They were too, too bad, too ugly to really address, um, both architecturally and from a technical point of view, which, uh, you know, as, as uh, Farah mentioned, uh, was a bit of a red rag to a bull, really. I said, we must be able to do something. 
These are really important buildings um, for, for the planet. So the original brief was actually quite prosaic, prosaic really. Uh, it was a straightforward data centre, resilient, reliable, not overtly green, but let's, let's kind of do what we can, you know, um, and flexible and fast. We built in a year, so a construction period of a year for a 10,000 net, it's about 20,000 uh, metres uh, gross building. It's quite a big building. So in our meetings with the client, we sort of introduced the idea. If every decision we make can be inherently wholesome, can be the right thing for the right reason, where might we go with this? What might we achieve uh, with this building that consumes so much water, power, uh, everything um, at, our, at our service for our flexibility with our iPhones? Data in, data out, that's what they do. It's hopefully better data out, but it's data in, data out. All these things come to support the building, power, water for cooling towers, heat rejection, uh, all sorts of things. We have waste heat, waste water. What can we do to, to recapture the energy? What can we do to make it a better process and a better, a better building? We looked at the future when you know, thin clients bring everything together. And at the time, 2% of the world's um, energy was used for data. So we looked ahead and said, if we look a few years ahead, we can see that we can save enough energy that Belgium uses. Now, what bigger impact can you have on the world than making that kind of impact? So we had a combined client eureka moment where we thought, you know, we're really going to go for this. We're going to go for the pro project piece by piece, stage by stage. And look at um, what is discovering the art of the possible. It doesn't magically come from heaven. We have to discover what this is. What is the potential for a project and its design and its construction and its output, its outcome? So we have to move forward with confidence. Then this word will come up a few times. Uh, having confidence as we move forward. Um, to, to say, well, we can do the right things for the right reasons, step by step, <coughs> each decision we think about, decide, and agree. We look at the inside of the cabinets, how to optimise data. At the time, City didn't virtualise, as it's called, use their racks very efficiently. Uh, they, they, they did for this project. We looked at the inside <coughs> of the data hall, how can we optimise the airflow, the systems that support it, the cooling, recovering the heat, using the heat, using the best for the systems, tuning to the variable demands of a, the inside of a data centre. Even to the facade, this is, uh, these are three options of the facade. And you'll see we, we discuss the usual things, architectural delight, planning, so forth, costs, of course, but also embodied carbon. Now, embodied carbon was the first time City had thought about this issue when deciding what to build. And the three options had different balances. And we chose, actually, ultimately, not on the lowest cost, although well, it's part of the equation, we chose on the, the lowest embodied carbon for that facade, cradle to cradle, so the recyclability was also part of the equation. So all these things added up to an environmental approach. We, we did use LEED. I mean, so far in the world, data centres only got silver LEED, and that was just for the office, really. It wasn't for the main data centre. Well, no, you can't be doing that. Um, but we looked at LEED as being a target, and we said, we'll target LEED gold. We'll do the right things for the right reasons, but let's do one better, shall we? But we also thought about people, designing for people, the occupants, so they're productive, and they're having a, you know, a good, useful day. So we have good space. This is the uh, office and actually cafe zone inside or outside the data centre, different building, uh, with shading and all sorts of things, a good, wholesome building. Every decision made to be wholesome. And this is a kind of montage of the product. It isn't, uh, I don't think, uh, an architecturally ugly building, as, as we are led to believe. Water storage, resilience, um, you know, and all the plant we have, but efficient plant, doing the right things for the right reasons. And the client really got it. John Killey, an inspiration <coughs> to us. He really got it. He was the Eureka man, if you like, who, um, who grasped the nettle and said, OK, if we're going to do it, we do it properly. We're going to do the greenest data centre in the world. But for me, it's also a warm, humane architecture. It's not just carbon. It's about people and how we can help people do their jobs better and enjoy their working, working day, even when they're running a data centre, if that doesn't sound pejorative. So the brief mark two. This is actually what we created together. This is the revised brief. Uh, it was the first lead platinum. We did so well, we exceeded our own expectation. We got a lead platinum, the first in the world, well above silver and any other data center. We actually were flown to the States by the client to persuade his engineers that you could do lead and do well in a data center, because they said it couldn't be done. So it was a fascinating process of education and expansion and, and engagement. It was actually built for cheaper than the original budget. So green was within the envelope. There were lots of reasons for that, of course, you know, labor and so forth, but it was built for less than the original budget, which I think is quite, quite an achievement, and did successful things in terms of its, its, its output. Its, its PUE, for want of, is actually 1.25, not 2.5. It halved the overall energy impact of this data center for the world. And now everyone wants to do it. There's a race to be the greenest data center in the world, highest renewables. It's, you know, the, the race is on. The race is 
uh, away. And, and uh, you know, I'm also pleased that um, LG6, uh, uh, data centre for Equinix, uh, last week won the best data centre in Europe. So this set of direction, others are now exceeding it, which is fantastic news. But also, tour de force can be kudos. It can be how to position. So moving on from exemplar of uh, typology into how do we help positioning? How do we help someone to do something they haven't done before and influence their, their way of working? This project is in the Middle East, um, the Persian Gulf in the center. It's a small promontory called Qatar, an independent country. We've been in Qatar for many years, helping Qatar and Qataris with many issues. So we had an office there for, for, for several years. Qatar was to bid the World Cup, complete outsiders, and we thought, well, we want to compete to help them understand the issues they're facing in bidding and hopefully winning uh, a World Cup for 2022. Qatar was developing fast. They're investing, they're building, this is, this is Doha, they're building a lot of infrastructure, a lot of buildings. They're really moving forward, a forward-looking country uh, in the Middle East. But it is a desert environment. It is hot. And we, I think everyone in the Qatar say, you know, it's quite hot here, you know. So they recognize, too, the issues and challenges uh, they have to face. This is my caricature of the brief. It isn't far off, actually. Basically, the brief was for a small stand. Playing football in the winter and the spring and autumn is beautiful. 20 degrees, lovely. So how, but it's going to be hot, so how can we have a, a small stand to illustrate green technologies? That's kind of the starting point for the brief. It does get hot in summer. This is a hot, a hot um, sort of uh, July month, what could be up to 43, down to 27, so it's quite warm all the time. Even September, 35, down to 17. So again, these temperatures are quite warm. I think it's to, to accept that is a, an issue. That is actually a photograph of the site we were given. So it is a very... You know, it's, it's a desert out there, isn't it? Um, <laughs> has to be self-contained, has to be um, sort of, you know, self-standing, an independent uh, piece of work. We started some thought processes going in our minds, but also to expect amazing. And we didn't think the brief helped us to expect amazing. This is their kind of uh, watch phrase for the whole bid. So the first client workshop, the client flew to London. We assembled a whole bunch of people, um, not, just, not just a design team, but others in Arab and outside Arab, other experts, to try and push the brief. This is actually uh, the flip charts from the meetings that we had, showing we were pushing the boundary, trying to test physics, push the boundaries of, of, of physics and their targets for spectators, players, and so forth. Really trying hard to expand the agenda. So here's another sketch from another flip chart where we're growing the brief into a small building. How can we illustrate, how can we protect from the sun, how can we get multi-layering to work to protect from the heat? And so again, these are actually the markup of um, our decisions that we've made. One of the key decisions we made was to consider carbon and the story of carbon for this particular project and it became most famous for this particular aspect. So we helped to redefine the client brief, expanding it from uh, an exemplar of green technology into something that demonstrated players can be safe, spectators be comfortable, a zero carbon outcome uh, and also to have an architecture that was an exemplary architecture for the desert and for this particular climate, not just the equivalent of a porter cabin with PVs on it. So this is the kind of the end, end sketch we, we came up with. Uh, you can see here a small building forming. It's actually a 500-seat, five-a-side football, small stadium, mini stadium, and an energy system that provides zero carbon energy. And these two components were to be used all year round, so we can naturally ventilate, open the roof, open the, open to the sky, and make it a much more exciting proposition than just turn up, have a look, and go home. The client got very excited about the potential of architecture to express um, the idea of working in the desert. Uh, and these are, these are the uh, very early sketch models that we, we knocked up whilst the client was here for the second workshop, where we, and which actually engaged them immensely in how we were going to take forward this design and express um, their particular needs. And this, this shows one of the uh, issues. Football won't be played until after 4.30 in the afternoon, and we played during the evening. So uh, we can uh, configure the stadium so that the pitch is out of sun at 4.30, and the shadow continues to keep the players out of the sun. These kind of things help to sort of set a new agenda, not just saying it's a pitch with a roof over it, because FIFA wanted to have an open air event. It has to be open air for FIFA to engage and say, yes, we want Qatar to do it. So a rotating roof. So a rotating roof, lightweight, multi-layered, multi-structured, shading, uh, insulation, uh, lightweight to move. And here we see a, a segment of it under construction, ETFE pillows to reflect the heat, uh, and the light framework in the movie. In the, actually, that's the fixed part of the roof. And so it comes together as a kind of an ideogram. So we have on the left-hand side the architectural uh, piece, which is a small stadium designed for the desert with the right materials and the right thermal characteristics. On the right-hand side, the simple stuff, PV, that's all fine. What sort of caught people was the middle bit. The middle bit is where we capture the sun and use it to cool the stadium. 
So we have solar collectors, we convert it to cooling, and we store the cooling. And we store the cooling because the football starts at 4.30, and therefore the sun's going down. So we need to store the cooling to have it cooling during the evening events and so forth to, to make sure it's a successful World Cup. So these are the mirrors, the Mylar mirrors. They move to put, track the sun, point the sun at the pipe, see the light, bright sun on the pipe, make really, really hot water, stage one. Stage two, this is the, the magic of the absorption chiller. You're very, you'd probably be very pleased, and I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but <laughs> basically you put heating in and get chilling out, and it's brilliant. It's a very old technology, been around about 150 years, so it's well, well proven, but this is the kind of the magic bit that makes cooling out of the heat from the sun. And we store it. We use basically an ice store. It was actually a wax melting store, but it's an ice store, and we put little carts in. Like, that's filled with bits, like you put in your sandwich box. Literally, they're about that big. Filled with... And we, we freeze that during the day with the, sun of the, the, the sun's heat. You freeze it, so at night we can then take the cooling out and cool the building through supplying under the seat. Very well-known technology. Also used in Qatar, independently of any green stuff, um, and also other parts of the world like Singapore. But this is a very well-established way of cooling a stadium. So we make sure it's comfortable. We do all the techie stuff uh, to make sure people will be comfortable, the cooler areas and the lower part of the building. That's the football pitch and the seating area. And that's the reality of it. That's, what, that's the finished product. This actually set up when FIFA arrived. The FIFA committee were landing, and they, as they landed, they actually said, can we please go into the showcase? We've heard a lot about it. We really want to see it. In fact, they came a day later, and thank goodness they did. Um, because a four-month construction program, so only four months to build this thing, with the concrete to give it the thermal mass to stabilize the environment, with the moving roof, with daylight coming through, and the insulated ETFE pillows, all that technology, but also the cooling technology. And coming up to the sort of line, it, the, the, the day before, the chillers weren't starting. So I had to go to the plant room, actually take my shirt off and get into the hot plant room where all was happening to get the pumps to run so they could cool the stadium. And it actually did cool the stadium when FIFA arrived. Fortunately, you, you haven't got me there in the picture, uh, but you, you kind of get, get the idea. And it was a much, much smaller plant room. And the final result. This has uh, helped Qatar win the World Cup. And it did a couple of things. It did that, but it also introduced carbon as an idea, and zero carbon as an idea into the Qatari um, framework. And they're now committed to have a completely carbon neutral game, offset flights coming to and from Qatar, and building large arrays. This, this idea is in all the stadia, um, and an energy infrastructure is in part of their planning to fuel um, the World Cup with renewable sources and using storage as a medium. So, um, you know, uh, a success in, from those two points of view. Uh, and, of course, uh, it, it went, uh, it became famous because of the, the world's press. And um, about a year later, I learned a bit of a lesson about um, uh, the power of the press. And I was in a conference and saying how uh, it will be absolutely fine, it will be comfortable conditions, you won't have uh, water breaks which will break the match up. However, uh, the game of three halves went viral um, and uh, I was in over a thousand articles uh, over the world. And on my son's playground, his mate saying, who is this idiot saying a game of three halves? So it's amazing how sport and that kind of energy can really kind of um, uh, <laughs> take you places. Um, we can also inspire. We can inspire. Two to Force also inspires an industry when an idea comes of age. An idea has been thought of and tracked through. It comes of age. We've been working with Sky Television for over 10 years on their site. We've helped them master plan. We've helped them do buildings, several buildings. Um, this is a, a view as if you're in an aer aeroplane. Heathrow is very close. And I show this image for a reason. Sky Studios is the building on the photo montage. This is when we were uh, imagining the art of the possible on the site. Um, so Sky site covers most of that. Um, we can see from the plane. And Sky Studios' first building with its own kind of, uh, uh, made its own impact. The world's first naturally ventilated television studios. Near Heathrow, you can naturally ventilate the studios whilst recording. Uh, again, a world first, well, on-site turbines, uh, combined cooling, heat and power plant by biomass, all sorts of good stuff in Sky Studios. And the point of this um, uh, illustration is it built trust, trust in um, us as a team, a combined architect and engineering team, to do the next office building for them. So we were asked to Jeremy Durrock's office at Sky, and he, was, he said, I want to do a pavilion, a temporary pavilion. It's only for, to celebrate next year when we come to 25 years, and it'll be to do with education and, the, and an academy. And uh, I want it uh, by, you know, in the middle of uh, 2015, please. He said, oh, OK, that, that's fine. Um, we said, well, you could do demountable. So it's there, and you can move it. It didn't have planning permission. There's no planning in place. So we thought we could demount it. And hence our thoughts started to think about how we would make it out of materials that you could demount. And thoughts go back to uh, the GH Seller Showcase, timber, demountability, and so forth. And eventually, they were so excited, it became a permanent building on the site. So, but they still wanted it in 11 months. So a completely permanent building, from start with no planning to finish in 11 months. 
and um, liking to rise to a challenge, we thought we'd give it a go. So the Believe in Better building um, is the next uh, big building for, for Sky, and we went for timber, and it became sort of, sort of uh, a theme that we had an award for a structural engineer saying, you know, that, what's the question? The, the answer is timber. Because it's the only way to get it fast, to get it engineered, and it's machined engineered <coughs> timber. It's not, it's not two before a bandsaw. It's actually a properly engineered product. So um, the Believe Better building um, was designed in three months. So for standing start, go out to tender on, on a performance spec in three months. Normally be a seven month period for design. Built in 10 months, there's a month overlap there. So we got some overlap of design and construction. So started doing piles after Christmas. They actually moved in in October of that year for a, for a, a 4,000 square meter building. Of course, we designed fast, integrated studio, working quickly. Timber helped us, but it has all MEP systems. It's a sophisticated building, doing all the right things. It's an environmentally responsible building. The glass faces to the north, so the solar gain's controlled. It's a public uh, engagement, so it's a place for people. You can see in, you can see out, so it's this engagement. And around it, a kind of duvet of thermal protection, controlling solar gain, heat loss, air tightness, all the good things we need from buildings to be, uh, to hold their head up high in today's uh, marketplace. Um, and we can naturally ventilate, mix mode, we had high efficiency systems, all the good things we wanted to do. And we also <coughs> tapped into uh, the environmental credentials Sky were proud of. Them trusting us all through this process to make the right decisions, <coughs> to do it faster than we've done before. So we have, we have photovoltaics, we have biodiverse roof, uh, and we connect to the systems that are already on site, these, these good zero carbon systems that are already on, on Sky site. And we even capture the rainwater using oversized cisterns uh, with a cascade. We capture all the rainwater. Um, so again, it's not a building that's been dumbed down for speed. It's a fully sophisticated building that addresses skies, societies, and people's needs and how they operate and how they enjoy the building. And a site photograph, how fast it went up. You know, seven weeks of the frame, six weeks of the cladding, just going on really quickly, enabling that immensely fast program. You know, Mace, uh, the, the constructor, overlapping all the trades. We mucked in with, with Mace, getting all the, all the coordination resolved really tightly. And the end product, you know, actually a simple inter in interior, very timbery. Originally, we were going to kind of have a, a, a tint to the timber, but actually the client wanted it to be a very woody building, as has been observed after the event. And this is how it looks uh, for an external shot and a side view. So again, the, the transparency, the place of people and speed, speed being the key metric. But also, the carbon story was immensely powerful. Um, yes, it was fast. Yes, it's be beautiful. But it used less than zero carbon. The carbon that's trapped in the timber more than offsets the carbon to build it. So you start off carbon negative. That sounds a bit bad, but carbon negative, um, which has got to be a great thing. And this is engaged, the speed particularly has engaged the marketplace and is changing the way that um, we and developers and other providers of buildings think about how they provide buildings and the impact uh, that, uh, that can be created or mitigated by choosing the right materials and executing it the right way. So a building by example. So, tour de force. I think it's quite complicated to, to kind of explain what a tour de force is, but hopefully um, there's some examples there of how a tour de force can make a difference, <laughs> change people's minds, change people's attitudes uh, to building and wider than buildings, beyond the building itself into the wider uh, sort of environment, temporal and even political environment. Only achieve it when we work together get an idea, we push, push hard together and deliver it. It's by no means a one person's brilliance. But we need to win um, hearts and minds. So it's the emotional commitment, getting up and going for it, saying, yes, we can do this. The John Killey, we're doing the best green data centre in the world. And the minds, it's got to be affordable, doable, programmable, you know, deliverable. So it has to be both hearts and minds. So a call to arms, how can we in our next projects think about a curiosity, a holy curiosity? How can we be curious? How can we explore? How can we deliver? And have the confidence to do so. Confidence crucial to have built confidence, to share confidence, and to have earned confidence in the outcome. Thank you very much. OK, do we have any questions or thoughts? Reflections? <laughs> about what it was like designing a building of that scale uh, so quickly um, with unusual materials how, how you know what what impact did it have on you know all the other systems not just uh, uh, the, the timber structure oh, it, I think the whole the whole process was um, we we're discussing actually um, 
uh, my mate for doing this preparation. Scare, it was scary because it actually you were pushing really hard and doing adventurous things. And it is a case of having this, this confidence of shorthand with your fellow designers, with the client, with the constructor, to say, OK, we're going to put notches in the beam to let the services go through. And those notches are this big, we've just got to go for it. They're that big and they've got to be used. And again, uh, the um, working together, because originally the first um, layouts on the, in the model didn't use those slots. So going in, talking to the contractor, saying, these slots are there for a reason, use the slots, and you know, your integration will be better. So it, again, it's thinking about having the idea, but pushing it through all the facets of that design. So architecturally, how is it? It doesn't express itself as a particularly timbery building on the outside. And it is very expressed internally as a timbery building on the inside. So this kind of um, uh, juxtaposition of a modern building that's made of a traditional material, but in an incredibly modern way, having the machining predetermined, so B and K picked up the frame, as it were, and developed design from our, our, um, our model, our, our sketch design, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, had to integrate all these paths for services, cables, and so forth. A different approach taken on the next building on the Sky site was to make the structure shallower so you didn't have to have that, that, that uh, in intensive integration. A different solution, but um, you know, this building going up so fast, you had to think about those things all in an integrated team at the very start of the project. John. All, several of the buildings you put up here um, were designed very quickly. Mm -hmm. Did we spend too long designing our buildings, and uh, would they have been better <laughs> if you'd taken longer? <laughs> when speed is a criterion, or a driving criterion, um, it's part of that balancing process of what you build with, how you build it, and the process to, to build. Possibly we do, we do take too long to design. Um, these, these buildings, uh, often there's much more we have to get. You know, this building here, for example, didn't have planning permission, so the client took a big risk. They wouldn't get planning permission. So part of this is actually saying the confidence that we can win various arguments, various discussions. So it, it isn't always easy saying, well, every building could be built like this. Using these technologies on a more conventional <coughs> approach with other, other uh, developer clients that we have, thinking about timber, it, it is fast. It is faster. Um, it comes with, a, it's all a balance. So um, uh, speed, cost, qualities, and so forth. I don't believe these buildings, this, this building here, for example, was a very, very fast construct. And you walk into it, and it's a compelling building no matter what speed it was built. Because people will forget about the speed. They'll forget about all that effort to make it fast. They have to live with the building day in, day out. So we have to, be, we have to when we build fast, for, for example, we have to have buildings that people will relish and enjoy uh, for the whole of that building's life and their life in that building. So again, think about the people that occupy the building. We have to build the right thing, not just because it's fast. So I think there's a couple of things. Um, where speed is important or of an essence, then we can think differently. And this introduces an idea of thinking differently that timber is deliverable at scale, at speed, with a quality uh, that is uh, uh, reliable. Um, and it's quite interesting in conversation with the clients about, OK, um, this is a machine timber. It's actually a, a, an engineered product. You know, it is, it is um, you know, a, a fabricated timber product. We can actually machine to closer tolerance than pouring concrete. So we can think of tolerance being tightened where we're not slopping concrete around the world. We're actually bringing in a machined cassette into a machined frame with understood and predicted tolerances. So again, it has other, other impacts that were surprising, I think, when we started the process. And in this one, certainly the carbon was uh, beneficial, but you know, speed was the driver for this particular project. We, I think we could design faster, and we could deliver faster, but sometimes we are constrained by the things of, of, of risk and um, um, process. It's a rather technical question, I'm afraid. The, um, you said that this, uh, this building is naturally ventilated. Uh, do you have to control humidity to, to minimize the movement in the frame? And how much movement do you get in it with such a big timber frame? Well, I think it, it's, it's actually a mixed mode building. So it's a, it has natural ventilation, and you can close the windows and cool or heat in the winter or summer as you need. So it's not purely naturally ventilated. Um, in this country, it's keeping the water out. Keeping the water out of that frame was, is the most important thing. Um, and uh, you know, we're building timber in this country and in, in other countries where they are drier, generally, in climate. Although we're quite comfortable, Austrians build in timber in similar uh, moisture environments. So I think the, mo the moisture content, uh, there is expansion, there is contraction. That's part of the, um, when we engage with the uh, manufacturers and the, the suppliers of the frames to understand that degree. But it is limited by being cross-laminated, by being bonded. It's not the same as having a, a piece of former two that will, it will, will change shape uh, with moisture. This is an engineered product you know, with a controlled moisture content. When it goes up and down, does it, does it, do you have any data since it was built? Whether not, we, haven't, we haven't tracked that particularly, no. It's not one of our, one of our, our trackings. Um, 
Yes, yeah, very impressive uh, project, Mike, from a sort of technical um, point of view, and, and also how, how the teams pull together to produce these buildings. But also, I'm very interested about how um, you obviously emotionally engage the client and, um, and how great leadership I'm getting from the client. I wonder if you could tell me a bit more about <coughs> the journey that you had there and who sort of fired uh, sort of <coughs> each other up and how it worked for really. It, it varied on the different projects, um, uh, and um, part of it, I think, is it just this exploration idea, how you explore, how you engage and say, because for City Group, for example, uh, it was at a time when they were dealing with all, all the mortgage debt in the States, and it was that context. And so sometimes, and decisions in those kind of, or an ambition to be doing great things and being seen to be good, doing great things, is highly contextualised in what the, what the client's going through that particular moment. And so this gave an opportunity to have great new story during a time of not, perhaps not so great new stories. So that was an interesting, interesting dynamic. It's all, I think it's about it, it, engaging with what a client's needing out of a building, really needing, and, and what, oh, other than um, delivering a cost plan and responsibly and reliably and all the things we need to do, what else is there that may, they, they may engage with? What do you pick up in a meeting that says, oh, that, that's interesting, how do, we, how do we engage with that idea? And then you pick up the idea, you call on your memory and your learning, and you say, okay, well, what, what can we do? How can we inspire? How can we uh, suggest something that the client will actually really want to do? Um, and it's interesting because the city group one led on to a great long-term relationship on the frameworks and all kind of, kind of things. So it does become a kind. Of, it's interesting. It, it, it does this thing. You do get an emotional connection with the client. You do get a kind of you know, a thing. And, and Sky is also a longer-term client base. So I think it's about engaging what really drives them. And on Sky, it was interesting. The first buildings we did explore carbon sustainability. Had a very strong um, brief from them for those kind of aspects. And so those things were straightforward. Um, for us, speed was a key driver, but there's also a, a beneficial and like serendipitous sort of thing about the carbon, which also locked into what they wanted. So I think it's about engaging and, and creating a joint excitement in the team, creating a boat you can all get in and row together. Uh, it's a bit of a trite analogy, but it's kind of, if you, can, if, you can, if you can phrase an idea or an opportunity or a question, people will be like, yeah, let's get in the boat and start rowing um, and go there, then that that's creates an excitement in, in, in the team. And it can come anywhere, from the client's idea, our idea, the contractor's idea, it doesn't matter. But that boat, if you can all recognise it and say, Let, let's go, that helps. Yeah, it's just a question about the climbing. And they obviously have a particularly enlightened attitude to, to the risk of such a big investment um, to proceed in you know, that planning and presumably you know, lack of certainty about outturn costs and so on. So I just wondered you know, what was going on around it as a design effort and you know, how the clients approached all those risks was, was sort of managed and how things turned out in terms of, you know, with the costs land, all those sort of pragmatic issues. Actually, it has got planning permission. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's one of those balancing things, and it's trust and confidence. Uh, and it was a really intense time. I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy, because it e it's tough for the client making decisions about how big is this building? Tell us now or tell us next week. We need to know by Thursday how big this building is, how big do you want it? <coughs> and I think um, as long as the team can ex accept those challenges and says, okay, we're going to go for it, we're going to mitigate those risks as much as we can, but we know there are manageable risks, then you can sort of move forward. I think there's also a kind of um, uh, a grown-up approach that we had as a team. It tends to be a bit, not, not to be pejorative, but it means that we had, it, it were experienced enough to understand that there were risks going forward, and together we'd manage those risks. So uh, Sky and us engaged with Hounslow and had the conversations, and this is really important, it's about education, it's about Sky Academy, and, and the Sky Academy uh, is intending to engage with a million kids by 2020, so it's a really big programme. And this kind of ambition, put in a planning context, helps get that big pen out and go tick. So it's a case of, again, building the, building the um, confidence, building the breadth of, of, of argument um, to manage those things. And of course, all these things are, um, when they're so fast, you try and contain that in a kind of expectation envelope, uh, but it pops out from time to time. Sometimes you've got to rush around and do things and, and I say, paddle very hard, commit to getting something. That, so there's a thing that you know, failure isn't an option with these kind of projects. It really isn't an option. You've really got to go for it because it was being opened on a certain date. You know? To open for business in their 25th year. So it's all about management, I think, and confidence uh, yeah. building uh, between client, architect, engineer in, in that kind of world. I was just going to say, what, what stage did you get the contractor involved to try and meet that particularly challenging program? Oh, it's fascinating. We had, um, when it was a temporary pavilion, we had temporary pavilion contractors. And uh, then, then it became a sort of, uh, then it morphed into something a bit more permanent, so more permanent contracts came on board. So it was, it was, it's hard to say, it would overlap completely. 
Um, uh, MACE were, uh, were also working on site on another large building, that Arabs Engineering, another big building on site. Um, so they were already on site, so they, were, they, could, they, could, they could actually um, mobilize very quickly. Uh, and they were involved, I think we, we started, well, we, we were sort of into stage two, uh, we did a sort of stage two stroke three issue. Um, so of course, part of that process was uh, we were um, engaging with the timber, timber suppliers already. We, you know, so the contracting world was absolutely part of it. And we were, from the very first moment when timber frame was an idea, was a proposition, talking to the supply chain. What do you need? How do you build it? How do you make this the, the, the frame of the building? So I think uh, the industry, the suppliers, were from day one, day zero, day minus two, probably. Um, but this thing about early engagement also fed in. So when the information was released and ready, it was picked up quickly and, 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 and moved on quickly as well, really to get the, t the, the foundations in place. And so I mean, the, the phone call came in sort of October. Uh, we want this building. And they started piling just after Christmas. So you can't do that from a, you know, with a one month mobilization period. Can you? So it's that kind of thing that I think is, uh, was this, this, this dramatic overlap. But again, the confidence that we were going to produce information at the right time, the right quality, to make the thing happen. It was all part of the process. So a slightly technical question. Has it gone up thermal mass in it as a, as a purely timber building? Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's a 24-7 it's a building. So thermal mass is slightly relevant because you can't cool it down ever. Um, one of those things. Um, it's a lightweight building, highly insulated, highly airtight. Um, so the thing about, about mass, uh, it's an interesting one. Um, I think. Th thermal mass in buildings is where you have, um, say, a, a concrete part of the structure, and overnight you can cool it down by purging with natural ventilation air to make it nice and cool, so next day you've got free cooling in the building. When you're working 24-7, when things are happening all the time, the role of thermal mass is always in an occupiable condition, so the thermal mass has less import. We discussed that, and in fact other building types were using timber in a commercial environment. We're thinking about using phase change materials of a similar property, or introducing a, um, um, a cement board finish so you can have a timber frame and have thermal mass to give you that, that effect. In this particular case, it wasn't really appropriate. And we, we've sort of learned from education buildings, which we designed with thermal mass, and then it was so popular, which is the Coventry University, um, they said, oh, we're going to run it 24 hours a day. So the thermal mass is, is, is of no benefit whatsoever. So it's got, you know, <laughs> a very interesting question, but there's this thing about you've got to be clear what your building's trying to do before we and then apply a, a technical solution. Oh, there's one more over there. Can I take one more, please? <laughs> um, how did you um, deal with the cost of the building when you say you had the manufacturers and the um, contractors early on? Uh, did that create a problem for the competitive tendering? And did the clients understand the fact that perhaps having a very specialised design early on um, opens, makes the design less open for, say, more people to tender on it and therefore making it? more expensive potentially. Was that a concern with Sky? It's, it's quite an interesting one. Um, we're, we're currently doing commercial buildings with, with, and we have six plus tenderers for the timber frame. So you know, we can go out early to six tenderers, get prices in, um, even at doing concept design. So there's many, many suppliers. We don't just go to one and get them to price it. There's many, many suppliers using timber from different, different parts, usually Central Europe you know, being Austria, Germany generally, or Canada or uh, Scandinavia. But, and the, you know, uh, Spain's coming into the play as well. So there are many, many suppliers. It doesn't limit the tendering. It's going out really early to up to six suppliers and saying, here's our design, what's your price for it? So you're, you're pre-tendering, in a sense, the frame. And then whoever contracts it can then take those on board um, as part of the contracting process. So I don't think it in any way damages or inhibits the competitive process. If you went to one, I'd agree with you. But we don't do that. We go to several, and then one prevails and goes forward on price, quality, time, deliverable, all the usual metrics that we would choose to. And that, pri that initial price stays the same even through the later resolution? Or there is no later resolution, it's all designed to the same? Well, that, that's building for you. Yes. Um, that's a general idea, yes. <laughs> what I found really inspiring was particularly the way Mike talked about data centres and the possibilities of what you could do with them in terms of sustainable design, which is fascinating because you'd think a data centre would be the kind of building that would have a sort of least investment in terms of sustainability and um, collaboration and kind of forward thinking and innovation. And that's what I found just so interesting that the possibilities of what can be done with it and the way that it's now more than an exemplar for new buildings and that everyone is also trying to achieve the same thing through um, pushing the boundaries in terms of what you can do in particular buildings like that. So that for me was just a real standout for the event. Well, I thought the Believe in Better building was uh, very inspiring. I mean, to see a building of such scale and speed in timber is, uh, yeah, really sort of showing the potential of that material, very exciting. Um, and uh, who, who knew data centers could be so much fun? 
I uh, <laughs> can't wait to design one. Yeah, well, you know, be, I mean, for example, the, the timber point, you know, it's often seen as a um, maybe a less flexible material, but actually, you know, that sort of approach could produce a, you know, an incredibly kind of flexible and useful building, and, you know, we certainly look at such an approach for future projects. Well, what I thought about Mike's talk this morning, it was truly inspirational uh, in the delivery he gives on so many projects. The Sky Project, the uh, Pavilion Project, they all come with the same amount of energy and enthusiasm. That's something the, the industry really needs now at the moment, is excitement and joy uh, and a delight to be involved with so many great things which we're building at the moment. We need young engineers, different engineers with a different approach. And I think Mike's approach really encompasses that. Mike is very people focused. He mentions that word several times. And what we deliver now must be about places that people prefer. At British Land, I think we're very much aligned with the, uh, the aspirational objectives of Arup in terms of putting people first at their places. Our designs must be about people, whether they're working there, just passing through or living there, or even on a transitory basis of just the temporary structures as you've done. We must put people at the heart of everything we do.